I want to start out, this is a, 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 a panel that's been carefully selected. This is the science side of the panel. So we're going to start out with Dr. Janet Seifert. Janet, if you would come up here, please. Would you join me in welcoming Janet? Janet has her PhD in biology. She's a faculty fellow at Rice University. She's been out there for uh, almost 20 years now. Uh, her specialty in her area Whoa, that was kind of cool. Her specialty in her area is origin of life and astrobiology. So she comes uh, at some of these questions we're looking at in an, in an interesting way. Uh, she is an unabashed believer in evolution. Uh, she is also an unabashed believer in the Lord Jesus Christ and is a, a very faithful, committed Christian and a very important part of the ministry that we have at church as well as at this library. And so she brings a lot of interesting tools to the table, will be an invigorating part of the discussion. So we start with her as the science. Now, if that's the science, at the opposite end of science, we're going to have uh, um, uh, someone, Leonard Allen, first of all, I'll just give you his name. Join me in welcoming Leonard. Leonard brings an interesting approach. He's got a PhD in the history of Christian thought. So as we're engaging science and faith, we get some good historical perspective from Leonard. He's taught theology, ethics, philosophy. He's taught at Biola. He's taught at Fuller uh, Seminary. He's currently at Lipscomb, has authored 10 books, is incredibly well-rounded in thoughts uh, uh, and historical thoughts about the whole nature of the debate between Christianity and science, if it can be fairly called a debate, or the merge and fusion of the two, and how that's gone through in the history of Christian thought. So I'm glad he's here. Now I'm also going to put on the, uh, we would call this the soft science. If that's a hard science, uh, uh, not in terms of difficulty, in terms of classification, uh, uh, I will add here to the soft science end, uh, I will add uh, uh, Rubel Shelley. Dr. Rubel Shelley, please come on up. <clears throat> Dr. Rubel Shelley, Rubel has a PhD in philosophy from Vanderbilt. Uh, his philosophy, uh, uh, the philosophy that he has studied is especially critical thinking, Plato, and things of the classics in that regard. He's also a preacher, he's also a teacher and more. He's taught biomedical ethics at Vanderbilt's medical school and is a huge ethicist. He still teaches philosophy classes, ethics, and, and other thought processes as well. And so we're delighted to have him on the panel. And then our feature, the core, the anchor, the center of the panel is Dr. Professor Alistair McGrath. If you would join me in welcoming him. Professor McGrath, Alistair McGrath, uh, what can I say? He can sit in any seat at the table. Uh, he has three doctorate degrees from Oxford. He has a doctor of philosophy degree in molecular biophysics. That's a hard science. He has a doctor of divinity degree in theology. That's something of its own. He has a doctor of letters degree in intellectual history which would be in the soft sciences. He is the Andreas Idrios, if I'm saying that correct? It'll do. <laughs> it's close enough. Andreas Idrios, professor in science and religion at Oxford. He is an author extraordinaire who has written on just about every uh, angle of so many of the issues that we'll be discussing today. He has lectured on all of this. Heavens, he's debated every major atheist who's out there, including the ones that are no longer with us, like Christopher Hitchens. And so he brings a dynamic perspective to this, and I'm really excited to have him join us. I'm going to begin my questioning, and gentlemen, I'll come down here. 
and I'll engage you periodically, but most of this is going to be Q&A from me to you. I'll stand out here so that you'll be facing the audience while you speak to some degree. Um, uh, Professor McGrath, I wanted to start with you. You went off to university in Oxford uh, uh, as an atheist uh, or agnostic or something, and at least you were not a committed Christian. And if I'm reading your history right, you studied first at Wadham College at Oxford University, and in your book, Mere Theology, you wrote the following, quote, while at undergraduate training, as we would call it, undergraduate school, quote, I was discovering that Christianity was far more intellectually robust than I had imagined. I had some major rethinking to do, and by the end of November, my decision was made. I turned my back on one faith and embraced another. Tell us what you meant by that, please. Elucidate. Well, when I was um, studying science at high school, um, I was very aggressively atheist. I took the view that um, there was simply no intellectual space left for God by the sciences. I also took the more, um, more um, uncharitable view that people who believed in God were mad or bad or sad or actually possibly all free. Uh, and I, I just took the view simply that, that science entailed atheism. And that was the view that I held when I arrived at Oxford to begin studying chemistry in detail. And then I think university really is a place where you're challenged. And I found myself being challenged at two different levels. One was, you know, I was an atheist, but what were the grounds for being an atheist? And I think I just worked on the assumption that atheism was self-evidently right. And so I was challenged to think that through. And I also met Christians who, in effect, were able to give extremely articulate defenses of their faith and began to give me, you know, a lot of food for thought. And so to cut a very long story short, um, I turned my back on atheism, which I there describe as a faith, because it is a faith. You cannot believe, prove there is no God, and embraced another faith, which was Christianity. And I've grown in that ever since, and it was the best decision I ever made, if indeed it was my decision to make. <laughs> <laughs> um, Professor McGrath went on to um, uh, not only get uh, his, his uh, undergraduate degree in chemistry, but he gets a master's and he gets his doctoral degree. Uh, his doctoral degree, as I noted, uh, maybe I did not tell you, but his, yes, molecular biophysics, published, I believe, in peer-reviewed literature, at least one or two articles I was able to find, as a scientist, peer-reviewed literature is a significant uh, uh, achievement in, in scientific publication, and yet at this time is also a Christian who then goes back and studies and gets some fuller education. So with that, I want to shift to you, Leonard Allen. As a gentleman who is uh, uh, a history of Christian thought PhD, why is it that so many people historically in the Christian church or in the Christian faith or in the scientific community have written on and used terminology of the warfare between science and faith? Would you comment on that for us, please? Uh, yeah, the, the actual metaphor itself uh, was the title of a, of a well-known late 19th century book by an American university president, basically using that metaphor to set up um, what by then seemed to have been a, a warfare. Um, the sense that there had to be a choice, that there was not a, comp a complementarian kind of view that was possible. Um, and um, I, th I think that metaphor held for a number of decades I, into the 20th century. And in fact, I, it seems to me that among a, a good many Christians in North America, the metaphor probably still holds, uh, though I think it's been receding steadily uh, in the 20th century. I remember an article, um, maybe it was 20 years ago, a little short piece that Mark Knoll wrote, uh, premier historian of Christianity and Christian thought in North America, and, and the title of the piece was, The War is Over, and he was referring to this war, and he was saying, even among evangelical Christians, whom he considered himself one, 
that that metaphor was no longer appropriate for um, the relationship between uh, science and the Christian faith. Um, but I think it's still with us in many ways, especially uh, in uh, more conservative uh, Christian colleges and universities today. Well, in that regard, Janet, here you are, uh, a PhD, biology. You are doing research in the origin of life. You are uh, persuaded academically in the, the truth of evolution. Um, though obviously other good minds can disagree with you on that. I'm not suggesting that that's the academic answer to things, but um, without loading the question, where do you handle this? I mean, is there a warfare between your science in your brain and your faith in your brain? Well, let me tell you a little bit. Uh, doesn't sound like it. Brent, is Janet's on? Try again. Let's see your little packet. Uh, yeah, you're on there. Okay. Yeah. Can there you hear go. me? Yeah. Okay. So maybe I should tell you a little bit about how I came to be a scientist. I was a mother at home, and for just by the hand of God, he pushed me into being a scientist. I guess some people get the call to be a missionary. I think I was called to be a scientist, which is kind of strange. Maybe that's not theologically relevant, I mean, or, or accurate, but that is what happened. My, my life completely changed when God opened these doors I had no intention of walking through. And I ended up in the lab of a theoretical biologist who is a person who looks at very deep time and how origin of life started. So that's a very tough question. We've been working on it for 50 or 60 years. And let me tell you that most of the time when I go to seminars, one of the main topics of conversation is let's define life, which we can't do as a scientist. So why I'm telling you that is because in science, we're just looking for some sort of experiment that we can run, and we put it into a context, context that tells a story. We don't even think about God. That's not part of the conversation. That's not part of the experiment, right? But I remember every single day on my way to grad school with when I left my three little boys at home, just praying, God, if I really believe you're the creator, I don't have anything to worry about. You're not going to give me something that's going to confuse me. I have to own the fact that I believe you're the creator of the universe. So I don't have to worry about any information I'm going to come up with. Most of the time, am I going too long? No. Okay. Most of the time in science, we get a certain number of facts and we have to make a good story so that we can get more funding. And a lot of times, <laughs> I mean, I'm just going to be honest with you. A lot of times that good story is something that piques the interest or causes some sort of debate. Now, one thing that does happen in science we don't talk about being religious. We don't talk about any kind of Christian uh, or, or faith kind of attribute to the experiments that we run. But I will tell you this, in science, until you get a certain reputation behind you, you have to sort of hide the fact that you're a faithful person because you will be viewed as being not as smart or having a prejudice against what you're going to find in science. That's the one thing that I have a problem with in science. That should not be, that should not be something that we have to deal with. All right. In this regard, Professor McGrath, um, by the way, among everything else, he's also the professor of divinity at Gresham College, which is a position that's been in existence by my research since 1597. It's pretty, pretty cool. You don't look that old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he carries that well. Um, <laughs> you'd almost have to be that old to write as much as he's written. <laughs> you just have done so much. Um, Anyway, I, I looked, and, and it looked to me like uh, uh, for a period of time you were going to be giving a series of public lectures on science, faith, and God. The big questions. 
Set out for us what these big questions are, please. Well, they're big questions that we call big audience because you know, they're, they're important. These are questions which I think science rightly asks. Why are we here? How are we here? You know, that sort of thing. But actually, one of the things that I think we were going to be opening up probably in this discussion is whether, in the end, science finds itself asking questions which it doesn't have the resources to answer. And more than that, these, these are important questions, what you might call existential questions, like, do I really matter? What is the point of being human? I mean, science is, in my view, very good at telling us how we came to be here, but it's not really very good at when, you know, about why we're here. And so one of the points I try to make in this lecture course was basically science is filling in part of the big picture of life. But it's asking, if I'm good, very, very crudely, how questions. Whereas we want to ask deeper questions. And in many of what science is doing is taking things to bits so we can see how they work. What we want is a way of looking at things that puts it all back together again so we can see what it means. And so in many ways what I was trying to say is that maybe science helps us see how the world works, but faith, Christianity, gives us that deeper vision of why things matter, how they hang together. And for me, as a scientist, to try to think through how I relate my science and my faith. It seems to me that you know, it's up to each of us to try and find a negotiated um, way of holding these things together. But for me, certainly one of the most important points to make is that actually faith does have some very important things to say. And if anything, it enriches our understanding of science rather than actually negating it. So that needs an awful lot of unpacking and explaining. But for me, we're talking about not the warfare of science and faith, but rather when they're both rightly understood, the potential enrichment of science and faith. All right, I'm going to stay with you for just a moment, and I'm going to ask you this. How does faith enrich our understanding of science? Well, as I was saying earlier, I was an atheist who became a Christian, but I loved science before and I loved science afterwards, so I had to figure out ways of kind of holding these together. But maybe I can put it like this. Um, Albert Einstein once said that the eternal mystery of the universe is its explicability. And you know, that, that's something that science assumes. But very often you find science assumes things which actually it can't prove, except by a very circular form of argumentation. If Christianity is right, it gives you this big picture of reality which immediately says the God who made this world also made us, we bear God's image, and therefore our capacity to make sense of things actually makes sense. And so I can put it like this, Christianity gives you this bigger way of looking at science, which A, makes sense of its successes, and B, gives you a way of realizing there are some questions it's not going to answer. And so if you like, science gives us one side of the coin, but there's another side of the coin. So let me give you one example from Einstein, and then I'll shut up. Okay, this is Einstein um, talking to, the friend, friend to a family um, whose um, a prominent member had died. The, the man who died was a man called Michel Besso. He was a very prominent physicist, and he died. And Einstein wrote a little condolence note to the family. He said, believing physicists like Michel and I know that the difference between past, present, and future is only an illusion. And, <laughs> and in effect, you know, I often wonder how the, the family reacted to that condolence <laughs> note. Um, but interestingly, Einstein's friends made the point that actually Einstein was right at a purely physical level. There's past, there's present, there's future. We're there in the present, we're not there in the future, we're not there in the past. But for us, that matters profoundly. You know, it really matters whether we're alive or not. And the point that Rudolf Carnap and others who read Einstein here was very simply this. Einstein knew that science had some very good answers, but they didn't scratch where people itched. And that's the point I'm trying to make. We need more than just answers about the functionality of the universe. We want those deeper existential questions about why, about what the purpose of life is, what its value is. And science doesn't really do that, but faith does. So there's a way, I think, of bringing these together. Sure, there'll be boundary disputes, but you can see there's a doorway there which might open up some very helpful, and if I dare say it, enriching conversations. Okay, now I would suggest, if, if I can encapsulate where we've been in my brain to where I'm about to transition us to. So if Professor McGrath is correct, and it makes sense, 
that faith uh, enriches our understanding of science uh, and, and that they're separate territories and there's a door between them. My suggestion is maybe that door is also a two-way door in the sense that science can also enrich our understanding of faith. And so I'm going to shift over to this side for a moment and I'm going to pepper you two with this area. Does science enrich our understanding of faith? I'll throw out one suggestion to seed you with an idea of what I'm talking about and then I'd like you to both comment in whichever order you choose. My example would be uh, in the first chapter of Romans Paul writes and informs the Romans that uh, 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 the universe itself reveals the, the uh, hidden characteristics and qualities and divine power and nature of our God. And I would suggest that we live in a cause-effect universe that tells us something about the cause and effect God whom we worship. We live in a universe that's reliable. We know the sun will rise from the east tomorrow. We don't, we're not 99% sure. We're confident. We know well enough the orbit of the moon to where we will be able to put a rocket on a specific rock when we send it off. I mean, it is very reliable. It is common sense in some ways, and I think that reveals to us some of God's reliability, God's logic, God's uh, uh, nature and characteristics. That's an example. That's my example. My question to you then is, how does science help inform our faith? And if you're stuck, I'm going to probe you with a more specific one, but first I'll give you your choice. The scientist and the theologian are both trying to do the same thing. Each meets reality. We meet reality in terms of hearing words, testimony about things that have happened before we were here, history. We meet facts in terms of what we call science, the empirical investigations we've made, the studies we've made, what we've learned about health or things that destroy health and the things that help to restore, bring us back to health. The, the scientist and the theologian are facing the same set of facts. And if they are doing honest reflection, they're trying to do the same thing with the facts. Facts don't scream their meaning to us what reason does, what reflection does, what the knowing subject does, is to look at whatever set of facts, testimony, scientific data, whatever. And, and we put the pieces together, remember it's like a puzzle, and what philosophy, theology, science, what they do is to say what is the best narrative, story, to use Janet's term, uh, I, I would probably use the, the word, what's the best read or interpretation of these facts? And w one interpretation is to say, well, those things are just there, they happened, and they don't have any ultimate meaning. So we just grapple with them, we deal with them, we do the best we can. Another look at them says, hmm, when things present themselves to me in other areas, computer, automobile that functions, whatever, it's because somebody's put those things together with an end in mind and wonder if that's possible for all of these facts that I'm encountering. And that's a theological interpretation of it to say, it looks like there might be intent behind this. Looks like, looks like this might not be just an accident. This, this might in fact be the result of some plan. Oh, but if it's a plan, it must be a bigger plan than we had. Could, could there possibly be a step back before this human experience and our meeting data, facts, and trying to make sense of them? Could there be a greater mind than the human mind? And could there be a greater purpose than any one of us has in a single human purpose? Oh, could that be creation? I don't think there's a war. 
theologians and scientists have fought, but I don't think there's a war between those two, I'm going to call both, reasonable interpretations of the data. And as the discussion happens between, let's say, the, the, the physicalist, the person who has not yet entertained the idea or is resistant for some, for some reason to the idea that this might have been a, the end result of design and purpose, the theologian comes in and says, but, but it occurs to me that at least by analogy, other things that work this well have had a designer, could it be? I think out of that kind of dialogue, constructive and good things might happen because if there is a God, all truth belongs to Him. Everything that's out here to encounter, whether it's witness of lives before ours or science, it's because it is there. And this thing that we have called intellect or reason, whether it just jumped off the physical organism somehow or if it was given to us by God and Professor McGrath even as part of our being in his image and likeness. I think a fruitful discussion between the two might say we are looking at the same facts, the truth, and each of us is bringing insights to it that the other could benefit from very truly. I don't have the scientific expertise of the person that I go to when my body gets out of shape, a physician when I have disease. I don't, I pray for health, but I'm, I'm grateful for what the physician contributes to health as well. I happen to have a physician who, in addition to the medicine he prescribes, also believes that the body that he's treating and that I'm bringing to him is created by God, and he, he actually prays over the person, as well as, oh, I think that's a good way for science and for, uh, let's call it faith and reason, for faith and reason to come together. They should never be enemies. They should never be at war with each other. Each is providing a valuable insight to the other. And if all truth is real and meaningful, from my perspective as a theist, if all truth is God's truth. I'm not afraid of what the science tells me. I invite it. I welcome it. I need it. It's part of God's call to us. Created it, said, take charge of this for me. Be co-regents of your world with me. Um, forget the war. Let, let's, let's learn from each other and let each discipline enrich the other. All right, so I, I've, you've said a couple of things that I want to engage Professor McGrath on in a moment, so don't lose track of it. I'll remind us what it was, but I don't want to lose Leonard's comments on this let me first. Let me use a historical example that I think builds or gives a sort of a backstory to this. In the modern period, beginning, I guess, the early modern period, uh, one of the most common ways of talking about what we'd call science and Christianity was the sense that God is the author of two books, two volumes. Uh, there is the book of nature, and there is the book of Revelation, the Bible. And um, this sort of portrayed in, in that season, at least for a while, a very harmonious sense that God has this whole realm of nature and of revelation, his will for us as humans, that fits together nicely like two matching books on the Welcome shelf. Welcome to both. <laughs> yeah. 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 And what began to happen, it seems to me, oversimplifying, is that with the rise of modern science, the scientific revolution, we began to learn to read the book of nature in a new way. And the results were eventually stunning, the things you could accomplish by reading this book of God with certain kinds of tools, call it the scientific method. And then it was not long before the connection was made that if, if this particular method of reading that book of God has such wonderful and beneficial results in the world, uh, maybe we should read the Bible with those, that same method, the scientific method. And so by, say, 19th century, certainly in America, uh, with, uh, with the using of, of a philosophical tool called Baconian science, uh, they begin to try to read the Bible with a new kind of literalness, where you want to find in the Bible not 
not um, deep typological and symbolic kinds of things that you know are kind of dense but you want to find the facts just like the facts of nature brought such progress the Bible facts could bring its own kind of progress which in that age would have been the uniting of all these divided denominational tr warring traditions and so for, for a while a fairly short season there was this sense that wow science and Christian faith are marching forward hand in, st in step together and who knows what the results can be now that fell apart and by say Darwin's time that was already beginning to fall apart and the, the warfare metaphor began to emerge, and there's a whole story there, too. All right. Well, we'll pursue that, but uh, Professor McGrath, I'm coming back to you with this. In a sense, what I'm hearing with the two-book analogy, what I'm hearing with, with uh, what Rubel had to say is kind of an echo of what you hinted at before, that science might give us the how, but science cannot give us the why. Uh, it, it might tell us uh, how I came to be, uh, but it might not talk about why or what my purpose is in being. Okay? There was a, a, a movement that uh, uh, you're familiar with, and I'm not sure that most everybody else necessarily is, but the theological, critical realism movement. Where, where a number of, of scientists turned theologians almost started taking their scientific approach to things, Polkinghorne, for example, and, and others, and using that science to help infuse their understanding and study of, of faith and matters of faith. Would you comment on that for us? Well, I will. Um, let me just add one thing to what these two gentlemen very helpfully said, and I'll look at that. I mean. I think one of the points that we're making here is that um, very often when you look at nature, you, you can see it scientifically, and that's right, but there is a lot more that needs to be said. And there's a beautiful example of this in the Old Testament, Psalm 19.1, the heavens declare the glory of the Lord. And of course, Israel knew perfectly well there was a God. It wasn't saying, hey, we've suddenly discovered there's a God because look at the night sky. There's much more that we already know there's a God. But the beauty, the majesty, the solemnity of the night sky enriches our understanding of God. It brings home at the aesthetic, at the imaginative level, truths that we already know at a cognitive level. So that's another way of just looking at that. Polkinghorn. Polkinghorn says a number of very interesting things. Let me tell you two of them and see how you respond. Number one, the scientist works on the assumption that you need to let nature tell you what it's like rather than laying down in advance what form it should take. And you don't assume that my rationality is the same as that of nature. You try to find out the way in which nature works rather than saying reason says this is the way it's got to be so that's the way it is. And that's one of the reasons why science very often is so counterintuitive because we have these preconceived ideas. Polkinghorn then makes the point the same ought to be true in theology. That in effect we have to be told the way things are. We have to let God tell us what he's like rather than in effect you know, laying down what we think God ought to be like. So there's a very interesting parallel there. And another point that Polkinghorne makes which I think is very, very helpful for us as we think about this is to do with the idea of mystery. Let me explain what he means by that. What he's saying is that very often when we're dealing with something so vast and complex like the universe, that quite frankly we struggle to take this in. And there's a real danger that what we will do is try and reduce the complexity of nature to something we can manage. In other words, we reduce it and simplify it and distort it. And Polkinghorne was saying exactly the same thing happens in theology. That we take something wonderful like God and try to reduce God to manageable proportions. And in doing so, we lose any sense of the wonder and the majesty of God. And Paul King was saying, look, we've got to let... We're having a good time and really appreciating it. Brent's going to fix this. He's, he's okay. fast I'll just keep going. Keep going. I'll You're keep doing going. great. What Paul King was saying is, you know, the temptation is to take something really complex 
and dilute it and distill it, and you lose something enormous, like with God. You, in effect, reduce God to something we can cope with intellectually. Whereas the doctrine of Trinity blows our minds, and it's meant to, because it's saying we can never get this God into our heads. So I, I think there's a good dialogue to be had there. I've just given you a few examples. That could go on. Um, a lot of people may not, uh, especially being in the U.S., may not know uh, Dr. Or Sir John Polkinghorne. I think he's a, I think he's a sir. Okay, that. Brent, is there anything I should be doing different? Okay, is it my mic, perhaps? Okay, well, we'll continue to work on this, and uh, uh, y'all just bear with us, and trust me, the material is worth the difficulty. <laughs> um, a lot of people here may not know who Sir John Polkinghorne was or is. I, I think he's still alive, but uh, uh, he was a, 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 a physicist of incredible renown, one of the Royal Academy. Uh, I, tell us who he was and the turn his life took. Paul Kihon, um became one of the youngest full professors of physics at Cambridge University. And um, basically was noted for his work in quantum field theory. And late in his life, or in terms of his career, he decided that really he, it was time for him to follow through on something that he was seeing as increasingly important, and that is the relationship between his science and his faith. And so he resigned his chair at Cambridge and began to study theology. He went into the Church of England as a minister, and then returned to Cambridge actually as a senior academic, president of Queen's College. But in his writings, he's trying to say, I am a believing physicist. Let me tell you how I hold these things together, and actually how I find one helps me with the other. If you like the two books metaphor, whatever way you want to put it. But basically, he's a very good example of a thinking scientist who said, I can do something to hold my faith and my science together. Now, there are others doing this, but he's a very good example of someone who is an exemplar of trying to do this kind of thinking. I believe uh, one of the metaphors uh, he used one time was a reference to, uh, and it's one I've, I've uh, stolen from him, I'm sure, on occasion, uh, his reference to having a cup of tea in the morning. And you could ask him uh, how he came about having his cup of tea, and he could answer it in, in two different ways. He could say, well, the stove uh, created heat, which excited the molecules, which caused the, the excitement of the molecules in the kettle to excite the molecules in the water, which experienced then heat, which then, uh, uh, through the tea bag, assimilated uh, the oils, and da 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 da. Or you could answer the same question with, my wife loves me a lot, and she got up this morning and made my tea for me. <laughs> Both very accurate but one a bit more heavy on the how and one a bit more heavy on the why. And let's take the stage further. Um, answer one, because of the chemical reactions making heat. Answer two, because a cup of tea. Question one, answer one is right, but that doesn't mean answer two is wrong. Exactly. So the key point Paul Kinghorn is making is you can have a scientific account of something which tells you part of the picture, but there's something else missing which is provided by faith. And I think it's a very good analogy. He borrowed it, you know, but nobody wor nobody's worried about that. <laughs> <laughs> who did he borrow it from? He borrowed it from, a, from Frank Rhodes, who um, was a British geologist who went on to become president of Cornell. And he used it back in 1956. Well, Sir John, I don't feel so bad at using it without attributing it to Polkinghorne now. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't his anyway. So, Janet, we, we hear about all of this stuff, and, and we come back to you now. Now, you were one of the ones who introduced me to uh, uh, Dr. Professor, or whatever we would call him, Simon Conway Morris at Cambridge, who is one of the guys. I would assume he is the man uh, as far as the Burgess Shale, as far as the evolutionary story that is told from that Yes. Uh, uh, Shale, uh, uh, I think he's and Gould are the two most cited 
evolutionist in publication today. Uh, we've had him speak here. He's a fervent uh, uh, believer in the virgin birth, the physical death and the physical resurrection of Jesus and very devout in his faith. Uh, an interesting gentleman for me to meet through you and, and to get to know. Um, you encounter people who have this aspect of faith and have this aspect of science and, and, and you see them married but you also see them uh, uh, in such different camps that one can ridicule the other. So you hear these people talk. I, wanted, I want your post-game commentary. I want to know what your thoughts are as you listen to this. So I think in science, uh, especially the fields that I've been in, which talking about origin of life and evolution, I think that scientists, a lot of them, believe that they're going to find every answer. And I think they've told the public they're going to find every answer. Now I'm going to tell you, there's nothing more exciting than getting a data set and figuring out something from it, figuring out the how. I mean, it's exhilarating. It's a little bit addictive, actually. You, know, you get your own kind of opinion going about what the data said. But for me personally, if that's all there was, if that's the only context I could put that in, I would be bereft. I wouldn't have, there wouldn't be enough in my life. So my problem right now with the science community and what he's talking, what these gentlemen have talked about is that they have, we have sold most of the public in the United States, I'm not going to speak for anywhere else, that science is going to tell you absolutely everything. And that's not a true statement. I mean, I think I work with a lot of people who think they're going to find and they're going to make life in the lab. And if they do one day, I mean, I'm going to look at it and see what they said, but I'm going to tell you right now, they're very far away from that. We can't even define that. Do I have a problem with them trying to do that? No, it's part of this beauty of understanding about what life is on this planet. It's part of the natural curiosity that we have as human beings. It's the mind God gave us. So I don't have a problem with doing it. And if you're a believer, you should not have a problem with them doing it. There's nothing scary about it. God's in control of it all. But that, just finding those facts about how things happen is not enough for, the, for humanity. There's something else we need. And to me, that's how science actually informs you. Because when the day is done and we've done our experiments, we've made our story, we've, we're excited about what happened, it's still not enough. You have to know why you're here. Why, why you matter to somebody else. There's another part of me that's not satisfied by those, those science answers. I don't think I'm alone on that. Okay, I'm a lawyer. I try cases for those of you who, who might not know. Uh, I, I live in the courtrooms of America. I, I'm always trying a case. I'm always trying to prove something or disprove something. But I live and die on evidence and, and rules of evidence and, and how it all works. And so I'm a little, um, I'm, uh, I'm intrigued by this in some ways, and, and I've, I've got a soapbox I stand on, and so I'm going to use Janet as an example. I, this is really just a sheet of paper I tore the top off of, but we're going to pretend it's a ruler, okay? okay? For our visual purposes, this is a ruler. I'm going to give you a ruler. Yes, sir. A ruler is really good at measuring things. Would you agree? Yes. Can you measure the size of this water bottle yes, with I a can. ruler? Can you measure the depth of the table? Yes, with, I can. The width of the table? Yes, sir. Can you use the ruler to measure? Becky, would you stand up? This is my lovely wife, Becky. Uh, I just adore her. Can you measure my love for Becky with the ruler? No. But I mean, the ruler's really good at measuring things. I need something else. Why, why can't you use a ruler that measures things and measure my love for Becky? It's the wrong units. <laughs> <laughs> so if science is going to try to engage itself to prove or disprove God, I would suggest to you, Science is very useful at some things, 
but we've just left the realm of what it's able to do. Can I tell you a small story? Please. So I work in the statistics department at Rice, have a wonderful administrator who takes care of me. She's a wonderful person. She comes to me one day and she says, well, you know, you should be in the biology department, but I spoke to the biology. The head was actually a very aggressive atheist. And she said, we've heard that you're actually studying, you're gonna prove there's a God. And I went, I'm gonna prove there's a God? And she goes, you know what I told her? I said, well, if anybody can do it, you can. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I can't prove there's a God. Nobody is going to be able to do that. I can prove it to you, though, from my own experience in my heart. I can tell you what he's done in my life. And there's not any way that I can prove his love for her. And I can't prove to you what I have in my heart, other than you just have to believe what I tell you. The scientific method's certainly not going to get you there. No. Let's at least a, a, a agree on that. Okay, so uh, uh, let's, let's come back around now. Because there is this conflict, make sure we're keeping our time straight, there is this conflict that goes on to some degree, and uh, uh, Leonard and, and Rubel, uh, both Bible scholars who grew up in a, in a church background, as we were talking over lunch, where the Bible's extremely important, and, and some might say, well, time out, though, there is times where science says left and the Bible says right, where science says up and the Bible says down, that there is this conflict that exists. Uh, and, and Leonard, I'm going to go with you first because I think uh, the example that most everyone would be familiar with was the 1615, uh, the, the Roman Inquisition uh, of, of Galileo, Galilei, and, and, and the question of whether or not the sun was the center uh, uh, of our solar system, or, or whether heliocentrism was wrong, and ultimately uh, Galileo is convicted. Uh, I think it was after he wrote the book that ticked off Pope Urban, but that's a whole other <laughs> subject. But uh, ultimately he was convicted, if I remember correctly. And, and, and the reasons in the conviction were passages out of the Bible. The, the Bible talks about you know, Joshua and the sun stood still, as if that was a unique thing, which... By the way, the Hebrew scholar in me says that we totally misread that passage. It's an idiomatic phrase we could discuss. But uh, uh, aside from that, over and over again, it, the Bible talks about the rising of the sun and the setting of the same. The sun uh, goes up in the sky. The sun goes down. It's the sun moving, not the earth. What, what, talk to us about this tension, but now let's bring it into focus on what do we who are Bible-believing Christians do when we confront these issues? Well, uh, first of all, let me go back to my um, two, two books metaphor, which is prominent through this whole early modern period. Um, part of what began to happen as people began to see the success of how scientists were reading the book of nature, uh, it, it began to have such um, dominance, such uh, effect, such attraction, that those concerned about defend, reading and defending the book of Revelation felt they needed to catch up. And they needed to begin to uh, treat the Bible more scientifically so that people would not, easy, modern people wouldn't easily dismiss it as unscientific because that charge came to be one of the biggest ways to put something down if it's not scientific. And so, in fact, that's what many Christian Bible scholars begin to do, is to try to turn the Bible into a more scientific book to fit the, ten the scientific tenor and standards of the age. And no doubt that had some good effects, but it also had some unintended, uh, seriously negative effects. In fact, there, were, there have been two or three really fine historical pieces in the last decade or so arguing that it was that very attempt 
by Christian Bible scholars and theologians that begin to make, begin to help ironically stimulate the rise of atheism. In fact, uh, the book by James Turner and, and uh, one others uh, looking at the origins of modern a atheism, they trace it back to those aggressive efforts by Bible people to make the Bible seem more rational, more scientific, to fit the canons of the age. That's one example, it seems to me, of, the, um, of this interplay and its problems, its challenges, um, and, of course, the drift of the 19th century, in, in a, more in Europe than in America, I think, was the emergence of this secular spirit and this new sort of respectable atheism that was a kind, of a, kind of a new phenomenon in Western culture. All right, I want to seize on that and jump to Alistair again in a minute, but I don't want to pass up Rubel, because Rubel, you have been a... Well, I could take a nap. I mean, I can just listen. I, no, no, but, no. Rubel, you have been a Bible teacher. Yeah. You have been uh, in Middle Tennessee. You have been in what, what for some churches is the buckle of the Bible Belt. Right. I mean, you're not just in the Bible Belt. You, you're right in the buckle. And yet you've got in the midst of there some very, very um, strident uh, right. uh, views of certain things within the Bible. So how do well, you... Well, let me tell you about these two worlds. All right. There, there is this world, and then there's this other world that I move in that, that's called, I'm going to call it good sense or reason or philosophy even, I mean, as a technical discipline. I can't keep those worlds, I, I just can't be schizophrenic enough to say, I, I, I must live without allowing those worlds ever come into contact with each other. So when I go to church, I must park my brains in the yard, and then when I leave church, I can pick those back up in order to go and do something that is logical, rational, or even scientific. Um, as a matter of fact, the, the, the common sense, good reason, philosophy guy can do some things that the theologians and, and the Bible students don't like to do. They can admit they made a mistake. There's new evidence that I had seen. And then in light of at least a potential mistake, and now the new evidence that I've seen, I need to recast my take on that. Uh, that, 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 that's being too harsh. I mean, some theologians, I think I heard of a theologian once who changed his mind on something and admit that he'd been wrong. But, um, <clears throat> and, but, but science certainly is open to that. Well, if, if, if each takes, though, this rigid posture, and let's, let's begin with the person, I, I'm going to call them without meaning to be pejorative or ugly, a naive person who's read his Bible. And there are seven creative days. Everything that we know has come out of those seven creative days, and he adds up, oh, genealogies even. Um, some of these people lived a really long time, but even if we add it up, and we figure out creation occurred in, what was it, October of 4004 B.C. The, the person coming from this side says, wait a minute, um, the, there, there's some rock formations, there, there's, some, oh, we even get carbon dating. These don't seem to matter. This world should be able to inform this world to say, you know, there might be a way of reading those seven days other than seven 24-hour periods. And maybe not every person who lived from Adam down to this period of time has had his age calculated in here. In fact, maybe, maybe, now I, I can't be dogmatic, which is what the Bible readers sometimes wanted to be. Maybe, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness moved on the face of the deep. Maybe that's what science is calling the Big Bang. And boy, the more I think about it, if God created that, I bet it wasn't a, I bet it was a really Big Bang. And maybe there was darkness and void, and God was allowing some natural processes to go forward to prepare. 
And, and perhaps at a certain point when God puts creatures now in his own image and likeness, and that maybe at various times, strategic times, God has intervened in that process. Maybe these worlds don't cancel each other out. Because I remember when I got into the Sermon on the Mount, I heard a fellow once, in fact, I was called to a hospital, where a fellow had read Jesus' words that if your right eye offends you, gouge it out. He'd taken a razor to his because of, he thought he'd done some inappropriate things that his church had condemned him for for lust. So he, he took care of that. I don't think that took care of the mental process of lust or anger or greed, whatever was going on. And, and I think taking that word from Jesus literally would be a sign in that case of probably some mental instability. Well, if, if I'm humbled here and humbled here and humbled here, I'm, I might begin looking for some interaction between those two worlds and say, well, one way to read that is seven 24-hour days, but science seems to be telling me. If all truth is God's truth, maybe at least I can entertain the possibility and not dismiss someone as a heretic who continues with this reading. I, 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 I'm not a young earth theorist, and I know there's some people who believe that I'm somehow a heretical Christian because I believe the age of the earth is billions rather than thousands of years. But it seems to me that's one of those ways where science and faith, reason and theology can be in helpful conversation without the dogmatic, I will not change, I will not yield, I will not change my mind, I will not hear from the other side of this fence. That's where the warfare metaphor kicks in, and that's where I think we do ourselves so much harm. Okay, so that brings a, to a, a logical question, and I'm going to transition us at this point to this, and I'll start with you, Alistair, but I want to ask each of the four of you this question. So all of you be thinking, and I pity the person who goes last because you've still got to have some creative answer. <laughs> <laughs> Alistair, we will start with you, sir. What are the threats to faith that you see out there in terms of these issues and science and, and matters like this? They, and and I, it's a wide open question. You can be specific about certain issues or you can be more general about the, the way we see those issues or what, whatever. But what are the threats to faith that you perceive from all of this? Well, let me begin by mentioning one which I think uh, was implicit in some things that were being said. And, and it's the view that basically could be summarized like this, that science is going to be able to answer all legitimate questions. And if science cannot answer those questions, then they're not legitimate questions in the first place. Uh, and the, the rather ugly term scientism is sometimes used to describe this way of thinking. It's a contraction of the phrase scientific imperialism. And you actually gave what I thought was a very good interaction with that by, in effect, your ruler analogy. Because the issue is, can a method designed to study the regularity of nature um, disclose the purposes of God, if I can put it very, very crudely? And the answer is, of course, no. Every scientific tool is designed for a specific research purpose, and it may work perfectly well for that, but it's useless when you come to try and measure anything else. And that, that is the key point to make here. But the reason I'm saying is a threat to faith is that it's in effect become a cultural norm for a lot of Americans. That in effect, science tells us the answers, and if science cannot answer a question, it's a non-question. And I think what we need to do is begin to challenge that. And I think it's very important to say that you are not critiquing science. Science, when done properly, is humble. In effect, here are our methods. They have their limits, and that's why science works so well. We don't presume to extrapolate beyond what these methods can disclose. But the difficulty is there are some scientists who we could name um, who, in effect, would argue that, that science must be allowed to determine what is real and limit reality to that. And that's people like Richard Dawkins, just to give you one very obvious example. So what I think we need to do is, in effect, um, say something like this. 
nobody's criticizing science. What we're worried about is people who are smuggling in a metaphysics, a materialist metaphysics, which in effect has some very slight scientific grounding, but science is being changed from a method of investigation of nature to a metaphysical predetermination of what reality can be. And in effect, that needs to be challenged. It's not good science. In fact, it's bad for science. But the difficulty is this is happening in American culture. And so the difficulty you and I have is trying to articulate, wanting to affirm science for what's good, but at the same time saying there are those who are trying to extrapolate, exaggerate, and in doing so, actually give science a bad name. But at the level of popular culture, there is this widespread belief that science can answer all of our questions, including things like morality and questions of ultimate importance to us, like why am I here and do I really make a difference? And so I think there's a, a conversation that has to be had here. And there are many other questions I know my colleagues will bring up in the moments that follow, but for me, that's a big one. And it's something that I think we need to open up. And your ruler analogy is wonderful. We need more analogies like that, I think, to help make this point effectively at the level of public communication. OK, very good. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, Janet, mm -hmm. what are the, the, the threats to faith that you see? Well, I could hardly articulate it any better than that, but especially with that British accent, but... <laughs> <laughs> But <laughs> let me just say something else. Let me just say something else about this ruler. I was thinking I'd never heard the, the idea that there's two books, there's nature, and then there's revealed scripture. And I actually like that quite a bit because to me that's a little bit like this ruler. So we can understand God through nature by our scientific methods. But to me, if you want to understand his creation how he made us as human beings in the image of him. I don't know any better book than the, than the revealed scripture. So if I want to, if I have a problem with my child, I'm certainly not going to go to the protocol book I have in my science lab and figure out how to do a PCR reaction on them. But I can go to scripture and get exactly what I need. And the reason why this, I was thinking about this is because I'm sure you all do Facebook, right? You see all these things about ways to make something better or something, you know, 10 ways to make your love life better or 10 ways to make your children better. And most of the time, I do click on them, I read them, and guess what? They almost look like they came right out of the scripture to me, most of them. They don't acknowledge that, but that's where a lot of the the psychology of us as human beings, the way God made us, I mean, he's, to, he's given us the roadmap, the other book that reveals who he is. So, so maybe the threat to faith is our failure to understand, uh, uh, and it's, it's very ties into what Alistair just said, but it, it's, it's our failure to understand that there's more to yes. it than the science story. That there's, there's two, two volumes. There's two volumes. There really is two volumes with two different kinds of measuring sticks, two different ways of approaching how we know who he is. And, and science doesn't want you, he's exactly right. Most of your children, if you have young children, I mean, they're going to be convinced that science is going to tell you. And he, he actually said the other part of it. If science doesn't tell you, then it can't be important. Okay, very good. Leonard, I know we've changed your microphone. Um, uh, and you, you said have to hold it right here. Does yes, hold it as close to your, even on your chin. Okay. That'll help. Um, yes. I want to narrow my answer down just to compliment the others uh, on a particular kind of situation that we face at Christian universities. Um, my university uh, has a very dynamic uh, and uh, well-respected pre-med program, biology and pre-med. And uh, I was just talking uh, this week with the person who heads that up and has been for many years, and uh, we were talking about this very issue. We have these, they have scores of Christian, young Christian men and women who, who very bright, very committed to their faith, come in from very conservative uh, backgrounds, uh, you know, are called to, 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 into medicine or some similar field, 
And um, when they, they, he's seen this over and over, I've seen this many times, the kids come in with this sense that it's either evolution or it's the Bible and Christian faith. And as they begin to get into their field and learn the status of evolutionary thinking right now, and uh, like the, um, the Human Genome Project, which was finished in 20, uh, 2003, I believe, which has changed the whole ball game, it seems to me, in evolutionary thinking. And they begin to realize what they're up against, what, what they're facing here. And they have, they have to kind of think they have to face a choice. And what tends to often tends to lose is their faith. They, they go to a Christian university and they end up losing their faith. Um, but because they, they had so deeply instilled in them uh, that you know, the world was created in six 24-hour days just a few thousand years ago, and that doesn't seem to be the case, who, who shall I believe? And they get set up, set up for a devastating faith crisis. I've seen it over the years, our biology Talk to any Christian university pre-med program. You see it all the time. Um, something's got to change there, it seems to me. We have to send the message that you can, you can use, you, you have nothing to fear uh, in, the, in the realm of science and, 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 and all kinds of good reasons to hold on to your faith in, in the God of history. Let, let me use one illustration of this quickly. Um, Back about 2010, there were two Christian university professors, one uh, in literature, one in biology, who did a survey among, uh, there are about 130-something universities in what's called the CCCU, the, the um, Committee for, or the Council for Christian Colleges and Universities. These are mostly evangelical-type Christian schools in North America. They did an extensive survey with faculty and students all across the CCCU on many different topics, but one of the topics was science and evolution. And uh, so some of the questions we're asking, do, do you view science and evolution as compatible in any way with Christian faith? And among students uh, who answered the survey, uh, fully two-thirds of them said no. They are incompatible. Fully uh, over one-third of the faculty members said they are incompatible. Um, and uh, th there was a book that came out of th this whole study called The Christian College Phenomenon uh, that shared all this data and then ha asked fairly prominent scholars to reflect on it. And it was very, very interesting. And this was the point that was made. We can't keep setting young people up for a faith crisis like this. We have to be honest with what's out there in the sciences, and we have to be honest and true to what we find in the Bible. Okay, so, Rubel, I want your thoughts on the threats, but I'm going to become a panel member for a moment, and I'm going to comment on what Leonard's just said. And I recognize a lot of friends and, and loved ones, family here, um, and I would urge anyone who really has questions about this to go back and find some good uh, teaching. And if they can't find any good teaching, I'll show you my teaching on this stuff. Um, I, I taught as someone who believes fervently in Scripture as revelation. That Scripture is truly what God intended for us to have, and it's a way he reveals himself to us. And that I believe the reading of Genesis in such a way that it excludes by uh, the different interpretations by forcing one view does an extreme disservice to the passage in Genesis that we're talking about in Genesis 1 through 2 3 and if you don't read Genesis 1 1 through 2 3 in a different framework you are missing out on a treasure of a beautifully expressive, not quite Hebrew poetry, but, but uh, uh, in, an, in an American sense, poetic expression of a very core message from God. That you see, you take the beginning, Bareshit bara Elohim at hashamayim va'et ha'eretz. And in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then look at the key verse. 
and the earth was void and without form. And then God spends six days filling the void and forming what he filled. And so days one, two, and three fill the void, the heavens and the earth. And then days four, five, and six form in what's been filled. So you have the birds of the sky, you have the fish of the sea, you have the plants, you have, and each one, and, and the days one, two, three marry perfectly to days three, four, five, then you have a day of rest. And it's a beautiful passage that infuses some tremendous significance to us, especially when you compare it to the other creation accounts of Israel's contemporaries where the gods themselves are the creation, where the hills are destroyed gods, where the rivers are blood flowing or whatever. I guess they may have been Vulcan because it would be blue water or green water. But, you know, it, 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 it's, the, it's so, so very different. Where the gods get tired of creating because it's so arduous, that they make man so that man can do it because the gods are wiped out. The distinctions are phenomenal, but we don't even get to those messages if we read the book of Genesis 1, 1 through 2, 3 in this framework of our science questions today and we bring up a generation of children that will think, I've got too much sense to be a Christian and we just really need to be careful I'm sorry you plugged in a soapbox I had to jump into okay Ruble threats to faith I think I would use the word dogmatism I think dogmatism is the great threat to faith logical positivism was a dogmatism born of science and you, you talked about imperialistic science that's dogmatism if it doesn't come from our world of physical explorations, it's non-sensory, therefore nonsensical, doesn't count. That's dogmatism. Over here is, again, without meaning to be pejorative, I'm going to just talk about here's the naive reader of Genesis 1 and 2. And a naive reading of that looks like a model for a seven-day week. Well, by the way, that's why it's being presented in terms of seven days. That's going to be the model of we work six days and then a, a Sabbath. And work six and a Sabbath. Maybe that's why it's presented in those terms. But if I'm now a dogmatist, because I grew up in a, a fundamentalist reading of this text, I now ha am forced to make a choice. I, I'm, I'm, I'm told that never the two shall meet. But that's, that's dogmatism. I had one of these students ask me recently when this, this, this does come up in philosophy classes, theology classes, students coming from these backgrounds Dr. Shelley, but don't you think that 10,000 years ago, m maybe 10 to 20,000 years ago, God could have created the earth, and yes, even the cosmos, with all the appearance of age that it has, but it could be just 10, 20,000 years old. And I, I think the, the answer I've given a lot of times before is, well, yes, he could have, and given it that appearance, you know, maybe he created Adam with a navel. You got that one later. Um, I said, but th no, I don't think God could have created things 20,000 years ago with the appearance of this great age because God is not a deceiver. In a Bible college where I started, there was a teacher who told the students that dinosaur bones were satanic deceptions buried in the earth to try to destroy faith. Cannot allow for great age. Can't, can't allow for millions of years, much less billions of years. I suspect he destroyed the faith of a lot of people. 
who took his Bible class and dogmatically were told this is the only way you can read Genesis and to read it and, and to allow for great age or for the age of the dinosaurs, natural cooling and, and expansion of the universe, that, that's not allowed to maintain this faith. Well, if, if that was drummed into them by this professor from the fundamentalist church, and he's going to become a physician, he's going to have to take enough science to know. And he's not going to hold this view. Dogmatism, it seems to me, is the great threat, at least one of the major great threats to faith. And if we get past our dogma, the, the, the opposite of dogmatism, perhaps, for this purpose, is humility. Uh, humility is one of the Christian virtues. We, we like to talk chastity. Chastity is a great virtue to talk about. Generosity on Sunday morning when they offer plates of it. That's virtuous. <laughs> but humility is a virtue. I don't know how to answer all the questions that someone wants to bring to me about. Certainly not the science field. That's not my discipline. Not the theological, philosophical field. I say, these are such deep mysteries. If we could get our heads around them, maybe we would be God. Oh, Humility says, I'm not. And from my starting point, I can raise good questions. I try to relate to those good questions the best data that I have from all my sources so that there's some degree of coherence, consistency, not assuming that this fact must rule out three others. Maybe I have to... William Van Orman Quine talks about the web of belief. Sometimes we have to redo the, where the, we place the strands uh, along the web because new information comes to light. So I, I guess I would say, Mark, that I think one of the great threats that I see, and I've dealt with so many of these students, is they've been taught a dogmatic reading. And yet there are people who come from certain other fields, they have a dogmatic reading and they can only exist to choose one. I live in a world of, of both and, and I'm allowing each to inform the other and to teach me a little bit of humility about, ooh, maybe I need to rethink, ooh, maybe I need to think about this. It's a wonderful adventure to think it through and scary to think that I would have to have such a, an ossification of categories that I could never admit any new evidence. All right, so recognizing that I'm not going to make it through everything I've got, <laughs> I, I've got one more question that I want to pose to each of you, but before we do that, uh, I'm going to, to take uh, moderator's privilege and ask two questions of Professor McGrath before the final question. Uh, and, and Obviously, I've got a lot more. Let me tell all of you, I don't know how many of you will be here tomorrow night. Uh, the registration is more jam-packed full than you could imagine. We'll have standing room only. But Professor McGrath will be preaching at our church. Now, there you'll see the preaching side of Professor McGrath, a little bit different, but he will be preaching at our church Sunday morning at uh, Champion Forest Baptist Church at 930. And then at 1055, in the class that Brent and, and I have, uh, I will be interviewing him for an hour in class. Uh, we'll be seated up on stage, and uh, uh, it's don't feel like you'd be unwelcome. It's a class that'll have seven or eight hundred people in it, so you can just come, and, and you don't have to worry about, uh, gee, I'm going to be sitting next to someone I don't know. You could be a member and be sitting next to someone you don't know, so you'll be fine. <laughs> Um, uh, uh, but I invite you to both of those. So, Professor McGrath, two questions for you, and then I'll do my final question for the panel. Question number one, why are there some atheists who have an evangelical fervor <laughs> about them to spread their atheism and to convince the world that there is no God, as opposed to, I mean, if if I were an atheist and there was no God, I'd be more concerned about gathering shillings for myself or food for my belly or offspring for my DNA. I would not be into this spending my time and energy trying to destroy the faiths of others. Why is there such an evangelical fervor among some atheists? 
I think there are probably several reasons, but I think the one that stands out for me is this very strong sense that Western culture is moving from religion to atheism, and that, just as Karl Marx said, you know, there's an, a, the inevitability of socialism, it's going to happen, but we can help it on its way. You see what I'm saying? Okay. So there's a sense, there's this inexorable process taking place, and we can help it along by our aggressive um, proclamation of atheism against faith. And I think that that does help us understand why writers like Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens actually are so rationalist, so enlightenment in, in their way of thinking, because in effect they're locked into that worldview. It, it's not like that. I mean, if, if one thing they very rarely talk about is this. They will say science is taking over the whole domain of faith. But you and I know perfectly well, if we'd be here 100 years ago and talking about the origins of the universe, well, we, we wouldn't have been doing it because the, the scientific consensus then was the universe has always been here. There's this religious language about creation's nonsense. And you see, we, that's a complete inversion from where we were 100 years ago. So I think that's a very important point to make. We need to understand these guys think they're on, in effect, the, the side of history. And one last push and religion goes forever. But it's not like that. I think one of the reasons they're so angry is that they're realizing this is not going to happen. Uh, we've mentioned a number of distinguished figures in the course of our conversations. If we were to add people like um, Justin Barrett and others to that list, they would make the point that it's actually natural for people to believe in God. And we would interpret that theologically in terms of being made in God's image. And that means you just can't suppress faith. And so in effect, atheists are getting angry because the arguments aren't working. I think that's a, a real concern. When you see your arguments aren't working, then if I could use a, an analogy from English football, you know, <laughs> in, in effect, you start, instead of playing the ball, you play the man. In other words, instead of saying there are difficulties with arguments of the existence of God, you say religious believers are fools. And that, that's what's happening. They're reduced to that level, quite simply, because the arguments aren't working. That's part of the answer to a very big question. Okay, thank you. Uh, um, second question that I, I wanted to cover, and you're the only one we've got time to ask, so I'm asking you. Why do you think there is such a respect and appreciation for C.S. Lewis, this English professor from Oxford who's been dead over 50 years now, and yet maybe never been more popular. Why? Well, first, thanks for the softball question. <laughs> <laughs> for those, if there's anyone here who, who does not know, I truly believe that Professor McGrath is the leading authority in the world on C.S. Lewis alive today. So. Right, okay, okay. Thank, thank you, Mark. Um, <laughs> I, I think um, one answer is a sad answer. And that's because nobody better has arisen. And that's a very important point to make. We are waiting for somebody else to come along and do this better. That hasn't happened. So we do have C.S. Lewis, and I think we're just grateful for that. Here's my answer. C.S. Lewis was an atheist who became a Christian and knew why he'd become a Christian. And so he was able to, in effect, speak to atheists and say, look, I know where you guys are coming from. And I understand your reasons, but you've got to listen to the reasons why I changed. And Lewis, I think, was able to offer this imaginative vision of Christianity, by which I do not mean a made-up vision. I mean the real thing, but it's rich, imaginative potential, fully explained and illustrated in stories like the Chronicles of Narnia, which captures people's imagination. So just one, one illustration, then we're done, okay? The illustration is from his sermon, The Weight of Glory, preached in Oxford, 6th of June, 1941, in which he says, look, our culture is spellbound by the idea that there is this world and there is nothing else. How do we break that spell? We've got to cast an even better spell. We've got to tell a better story and show that we have something to say which both captures the imagination and makes sense. And you know, a lot of our conversations today is very much about how we break the spell of this dominance of a scientific culture. 
we've got to make sure we can tell the Christian story in ways that captures our imagination. Which leads perfectly, I give you a softball, you give me a softball. <laughs> to the final question, it's as if you were reading my notes. I, this was my final question for each of you. So, how do we reach people? Well, how I'll begin to answer, and then my three colleagues will give much better answers. Um, Janet is at Rice University. At Rice University, the sociologist called Elaine Eklund, who's done a huge amount of empirical research on not just the so-called perceived conflict between science and faith, but about what helps people to realize it doesn't work. Here is a finding from a research paper she published a year ago. What she found was that what changed people's minds, in other words, moved them from saying science and religion are in conflict to saying, hey, we can live with this, is not arguments, but our scientists who have integrated their science and their faith and talk about it. Now, if she's right, that gives everyone in this audience who's a scientist and who thinks about their faith a very important calling because in effect it's saying, very often people will say, look, Richard Dawkins is saying this, but I know him, I know her, and, and they hold these things together and I respect them, so it's not that simple, is it? My challenge to the audience here would simply be, if that's you, you've got a ministry ahead of you. Very good. All right, Janet? I think I have a ministry. <laughs> <laughs> I think I would say, anytime you're around anybody, don't... Um, make an atmosphere where people can ask questions and not be afraid to ask a question or be afraid it's going to show some doubt in their question because you can't if you just harbor things and you don't ever get them out and then you listen to dogma and whatever else you're never going to be able to grow in what God wants you to where he wants you to grow so I think have an open conversation with whoever you run into excellent Leonard uh, microphone on the chin. Thank you. <laughs> um, well, I think in, in the setting of those of us who work in a university, and in, in the case of some of us, a, a Christian university, it's student by student. It's where we, we spread a vision of the coherence of faith in the world. Those you know, classrooms and lectures, but office conversations, books to recommend, and, and, and fellowship that is created. I think that's the most powerful way: is relationally taking our calling, our discipline seriously, and one student at a time, bringing them into a new vision, a broader vision of what this could look like. All right, Rubel, you're the last one here, but unfortunately now you've got to cover the non-scientist and the non-teacher. Uh, so for everyone else... I'll get all the rest out of it. <clears throat> <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I think I'll shift the focus ever so slightly to say the same thing in a different way. Our churches, our churches now, the one-on-one, -on -one, yes, what we write, and I've, I've used Professor McGrath's works as texts recommended to students in these one-on-ones, the scientists in the conversation. But some of you are, are churchmen, church leaders, and, and you're not in those settings. I'm a, I'm a pastor. I've, I've, I've done local church pastoral work for over 40 years. Our churches must become living apologetics. There, there is an articulated apologetic to, to put in books and to put in speeches and to have humbly, non-dogmatically with persons who are asking hard questions and trying to make it fit and, and you, they, they want help, they want a safe place to have the discussion. But the world at large needs to see churches as places where faith is not only a cerebral event that we come together to celebrate on Sunday that faith leaves those sanctuaries with all of us out of our different traditions and we have to stop wasting our energy fighting each other. There's no time for that. That out, out of our different traditions, different backgrounds, Pentecostals, Baptists, Presbyterians, Churches of Christ, Anglicans, whatever, 
we see ourselves as, as the church in our families, in our, in our professions, practicing law, practicing medicine, teaching at the university. We become a living apologetic that this faith that we are defensive about with our arguments creates in us a, a character, a presence, a, a willingness to enter into poverty and disease and marital unhappiness and drug addiction and, and to be there and, and to pray if allowed but if not to, to care to bear part of the burden ask nothing ever in return and, and see the church not, not as the, the Sunday morning argumentative dogmatic isolationist everybody but us but they, they get a different vision of the church, not as the people who go to the funerals with their signs, God hates, fill in the blank. But they say, you know, th those people, that is a society of folks who have eschewed hate and division. Whatever else you say about them, they're decent and good and generous and loving it might be worth looking at before I continue to be dogmatically dismissive. That, that's, that's part of the task everybody in the room can take. What a note to end on. Can you all join me in thanking our panelists?